This is Studio 809. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Outdoors with Hiking Bob podcast. I'm your host, Hiking Bob Falcone. You can find me on my website at hikingbob.com, which has links to my social media, my other podcast, my photography website, my newsletter you can sign up for that comes out about once a week. And also there's an email link there where you can send me an email if you have a suggestion, a comment, a topic you'd like to have discussed, a person you'd like to see us have on the podcast. All that is there at hikingbob.com. And also you can support this podcast at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash hikingbob, where you can be a supporter of the podcast and be rewarded for your support based on the level of support. So check that all out at hikingbob.com. Today I'm excited to have one of my favorite people, Jolie Nesmith, who is the newest executive director at the Rocky Mountain Field Institute, or REMFI as it's known. And um, Jolie, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. I have to, I have to comment, though. The newest makes it sound like there's been a bunch of us. Well, that's true. There's only been what? Three? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think three, three, four, four-ish maybe in there, but yeah, so yeah. I well, did just hit my year anniversary, so. You're, you're the newest, but I didn't say it was the newest in a long line. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Well, it's been a year, um, and you and I have talked a while about, about doing this, and I, and, I, and I hate getting somebody right after they assume a position, because obviously there's a learning curve, and getting familiar with it and getting the feel of it and kind of making it your own kind of a thing. So we haven't done this in a year because it just seemed like, you know, I, I never want to just jump in and say, Hey, you're the new executive director. Tell me what you're going to do. And you're saying like, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out where the keys to the executive bathroom are and stuff like that. So, you know, we've waited a year, you know, we did have you guys on for the, the give campaign and stuff like that. So it's not like we haven't talked to anybody from Remti, but I wanted to give you some time to get familiar with it. So you've been there a year. So I guess the quick, the easy question is tell me what it's like, but I'm looking for like, was it what you expected? Is it, you know, tell, tell us, I mean, it's not like you're from the local area. It's not like Remfi was a stranger to you or you were a stranger to Remfi. So obviously there's some familiarity, but was it everything you expected it was going to be? Um, I will make sure that our, our past board president gets to listen to this. Um, but um, and who is Jeff Mormon and who is an amazing human being. But um, we joke about that frequently just because, um, you know, I was hired. And then I think within 30 days, we discovered we needed to move our building. Right. So we moved the offices. All of our employees were still using desktop PCs and it was making jobs really hard, you know, because uh, half of our staff is out in the field so frequently. Um, so we decided to upgrade some technology and so we did some big overhauls within that first six months, right? Um, and also did them right at the beginning of our field season. So I don't know that I had expectations, but I did not know it was going to be such a big haul right off the bat. So, um, you know, and then you, you throw in the fun stuff that was happening in Bear Creek as well on top of all of that and this this newbie was um definitely thrown in the fire but i it definitely sped up the learning curve for me bob you know that old building you were in i'm i'm convinced it's haunted um only because it's uh it it's the old school you're not in there anymore but from the outside it looks like uh, you know the old building you see you know at the beginning of a of an old black and white horror film with thunder and lightning and, and, you know, bats flying out of it and stuff like that. I mean, it's got character, but obviously, and inside it wasn't much better. I mean, you know, it held together, but uh, <laughs> I think the change was probably a really, uh, it was a really smart, I don't think it was, it was a really smart move for you guys to, to move out of there. Um, I think when Bob, you're try, uh, go ahead. I, I would say when you're trying, when you're trying to run an operation, character is not necessarily what you need in the building. <laughs> Yeah, very, very valid point. The, um, I mean, the floorboards were starting to cave in when you walked on them. Um, only one bathroom worked. Um, and then we were notified that the owner was putting the building on the market. So we really didn't want to be caught off guard with having to move out quickly or anything of that nature. But also just for staff. I mean, if you had ever been in there recently, they were all sitting on top of each other. I mean, it was really hard to have any type of a 
conversation in there or to have any type of um like especially because we were all on zoom still a lot back then so everybody was on zoom if one person was on zoom so uh, yeah just kind of giving us a space where all of i think the biggest game changer for us bob is the having the warehouse kind of connected to our office space now right so all of our gear and our supplies are right there with us we're not having to drive all over town uh, you know, staff would show up in the morning and then have to go to one storage facility or go to a Connex trailer or go somewhere else to get all their gear together. And it was just really a, a, a not a good use of time. So we actually know what we have now. Um, we know where it is and it's all in one spot. So it's it's definitely um, increased some efficiencies for us, which means we get to spend more time on the trails. Which, yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I, I've been to your, your building and um, you got it taken us through there, you know, a bunch of us through there, and it's and it's really nice, and it's it definitely is, and it's better located, I think, for most of what you're doing, so definitely a better um, fit for you guys. Um, what are the things that you think were kind of maybe not what you expected, or is everything else pretty much what you expected when you moved into the position? I expected difficulties, right? Anytime you have new leadership, there's always going to be some change in the culture or something of that nature. And, and we went through some growing pains of just having me be the new ED. Um, but you know what? We're in a really good spot. We have really good humans on the team. And we just brought in our new class of the of field staff. So they just finished their two weeks of training. And I mean, everybody seems to be, you know, right on target where we should be. We spent, um, you know, the full-time staff spent a, a full day and a half really trying to decide what are our core values? What are the core values that we really want to live by, um, you know, as as we treat each other, but also as an organization? Um, and and they don't have to stay the same forever, but at least for a couple of years, and then we can reevaluate them. And I, I think that was really important for us as a, as a new team, um, just because we were able to all come together and everybody was a part of creating those values. And it's I think it's we're, everybody's really bought into using those and making sure that we're in alignment with them. Um, so I think that's been really um, a, a big positive for us. And we were definitely in a space of kind of, oh, my God, we moved this building, we all this transition, um, and here I am trying to get people to buy into something. Um, but but, but we, we're there. So we're in a really good spot this year, and I think we're all really excited for um, to see how much we can get done. Cool. Yeah, it, I, you know, your team has always been so much fun to work with, regardless of who's there. And, I, you know, some things change year to year with, you know, who's coming on for the season, stuff like that. But your team has always been been really great to work with, a very positive, um, positive group of people. You mentioned briefly at the beginning the uh, one of the challenges you had right up the start was what was going on at Bear Creek. And me and Kevin, my co-host, talked about this on the podcast a lot. You guys were facing some some rather unhappy people with the work you were doing, which wasn't stuff you dreamt up. It was stuff that you were asked to do by the Forest Service. There were some meetings that were held that kind of explained, because I think one of the issues with that problem was that there are a lot of people in this community, Colorado Springs, and the community changes pretty, over, it, it turns over pretty rapidly. So people who were not here seven years ago I have no idea why the things that were happening in Bear Creek were happening. And I reached out to the Forest Service. I think I talked to you about it. And I mentioned at a meeting we were all at that sometimes we have to remind people about why we do things and why and how these rules or how these policy changes came into effect. And I think that happened there. So there was a big meeting. I was invited, but I was away on, on a trip. I couldn't be there. Uh, where I think the Forest Service kind of went over everything. You know, the issue there was the cut cutthroat greenback trout, one of the few places in the state that it exists and it had to be protected. How did things go after that happened? Did that imparting of knowledge kind of turn things around? Did it get better after that? Is it better now? Uh, you're, you're, are you still facing angry mobs of people about why you're doing trail work there? I shouldn't say mobs. It wasn't mobs. It was a couple of people. Let me make that clear. It wasn't much. Just a few people really making life difficult for people. Sure. Yeah. There's a, a loud vocal minority um, there for a while. Um, Bob, you know my previous world with being the ED at Pike Ride, and oftentimes I use. Um, remember when the Cascade bike lanes went in, um, and Pike Ride was taking an awful lot of heat. I mean, we yeah. had just launched Pike Ride, but for some reason, people thought we were responsible for that 
for those bike lanes. So oftentimes I relate this back that I guess every nonprofit that I start at, I mean, I have to have some big debacle to deal with. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's very similar um, in that same space where people were just loud and vocal. Um, and for the most part, it is it has passed on. There's still people out there that would have a voice and are trying to be heard. Um, I recently heard there's a new sticker floating around that says F the fish um, by a group of mountain bikers. But I mean, it's, it is what it is, right? Like you, you can't, not everybody's going to love what you do. If everybody does, you're probably doing something wrong. I, I can tell you that after coming off of 15 months of the Blodgett Open Space Master Plan and, yep. you know, sitting, sitting as chair of the TOPS committee and um, I know exactly what you mean, uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to deviate too far here, but you've had staff who's been attending those meetings. You haven't, you know, necessarily been involved in that because the work is being done. But um, that no matter how much they change that or no matter how much they've listened to people and tried to make changes and tried the best they could to accommodate as many people, there's still get people who are unhappy. We've heard from them. We heard from them at the, at the meeting where we, we recommended approval with a slight tweak and and sent that up to the park board who by time this airs will have heard it and made whatever recommendation they're going to make but yeah they're, they're, it's it's one of those things that no matter what you do not everybody's going to be happy and i think you have to um sit back with that you know with the knowledge that you did the best you could now you guys aren't in a policy making position though so that's that's what made it kind of weird you guys yeah. were just hired to do a job i was in a kind of a policy making position you guys were just in a, in a, there to do a job and i think what what upset me the most about it and i was pretty upset about the whole thing and i made it pretty clear was that you were getting grief from people who were yelling at the wrong people yep uh, and when when threats started in you know possibly um impacting our human being staff, right? And right. not just our vehicles. Um, that was when we had to change some things that we were doing. But but yeah, I think, uh, you know, that to your point that you said earlier, Bob, too, was, you know, our staff really take that stuff to heart. Um, a lot of our staff are young and maybe the first time they've had such an experience where they're doing really good work, but people, they're not feeling appreciated. Um, so it was, I think it was a learning curve for all of us as well. And, and really, I think it's the same thing you just said, where at some point in time, I remember having a staff meeting and just saying, hey, you know, if we were pleasing the whole world, it probably meant that our work wasn't really that important, right? But because we're doing good work, there's going to be people out there that that aren't going to be happy with us. And that just means that it just shows the value of the work that we're doing. Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad that that's for the most part has passed and you guys are moving on with the new season. Will there, we're going to get to what you're going to do next, but will there be more work going on at Bear Creek this season? There will. We'll have a team out there again. I think we're looking at six weeks this, this year. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's around, I think four or six weeks at Bear Creek this year. And will that finish the project there or will you guys be going back there next year, you think? Or No, I would assume it's an ongoing project, um, mostly because of the, the greenback cutthroat trout, but also just because of the amount of use that that area sees. Um, so I think there's going to be continued maintenance in that area for a long time. Okay, that is one of the more one of the more popular areas for cyclists and hikers, especially if you want to get back a little further and away from yep. the city a little bit more. It's a, it's a, one of my favorite places. So let's talk about that. You guys have just, I saw the email, the season has kicked off for you guys. You've got, you just mentioned you've hired your staff for the year. You've got the training. Yep. What all are you guys going to be working on? Where can we expect to see improvements, new projects, run into your great staff, who I love running into when I see them out there. Uh, tell us what's going to be going on this season. I doubt that I will get all of them, but I will try to start and go in a loop around the southern part of the state. Okay. <laughs> um, so here locally, we'll be in the in the typical um, same you know city and county parks, so Palmer Park and Red Rock Canyon, um, a lot of those tops properties. Um, Garden of the Gods will have upwards of almost 80 days again this year. So, I mean, that park sees so much use. Uh, we're in there a lot every single year. Um, same thing, Bear Creek. Um, and then, you know, the big 10-year project on the backside of Pikes Peak. So we're about halfway through with that Devil's Playground reroute. Um, and we have staff. I mean, they're at they're at, at, at Treeline now. So they're hiking in all their gear and, you know, cacheting it throughout the, the season so they can come back the next week and, it's um that's a big project and it's getting really really um 
it's always been a technical project, but even more so technical now because of the elevation and the change in the the surfaces. Um, and then also, you know, just making sure that everybody knows that that, that there is no machinery <laughs> that's happening on that trail, um, and everything is sourced by hand. You know, so creating those barrel pits and crushing rock and all of that. So it's it's really a technical project. And then equally technical it would be out down south in the Crestones. Um, or down in the Sangre de Cristos, um, there at Broken Hand Pass. So, you know, on your way up to the, the Cresto Needle that everybody loves to go hike, um, we're also out there again and, and we'll continue to a lot of that rock, that technical rock work um, as well. And then if you start coming back up towards this direction, um, I would say like a, mm, way north would be Black Forest. So up in Black Forest again, also out at... Um, uh, the pioneries doing a lot of that kind of because as we know it kind of got washed out last year and how do we make that a more sustainable area going forward um what am i missing bob we'll be out at manitou lakes up in um so not in manitou but up in the near the that woodland park area where manitou lake is there's that recreational area that's owned by the forest service and then also down into the city of manitou springs and some of their open space areas Oh my goodness, I think I might be getting them all. That's pretty good. Um, you, but yeah. You guys have done a lot of work in North Cheyenne Canyon. Will we be doing anything there this year? Nothing in North Cheyenne Canyon this year that I'm aware of at this exact moment. Okay. And there's things really... always change, Bob. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With the, you know, you're, you're one, one bad storm away from probably being asked to go and help fix something or do something like that. And to be fair, yeah. North Shine Canyon Park, with the exception of a couple of trails that are going on right now, I think is pretty much met out its master plan um, projects. I don't think there's a whole lot left on that master plan that was done, uh, what's it been, five, six years ago now where that master plan was adopted. I think they're doing a couple of small projects right now. Matter of fact, um, today as we're recording this, which is going to be about a week and a half before you hear it, the park is closed because they're doing road work up there. Uh, all that. Yeah, so I think that that master plan is almost um, or pretty close to just completion. They've done everything that they meant to do, all that Sweetwater Canyon stuff and everything. That, you, you guys had a part in that. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. So that was a, a pretty big master plan process. Of course, with with the uh, Blodgett open space, I guess that there's a opportunity for you guys there probably coming up. And of course, we're talking about Fisher's Canyon. There might be some work for you guys to do there. So we're going to run into you someplace <laughs> out there. Yep. Yeah, just look for those blue shirts out there. Yep. So last year, you guys were part of the project out at uh, Pancake Rocks, which is another you know, really popular trail and one of my, you know, a place I like to visit a lot. And uh, that's out by uh, Mueller State Park, out between Divide and Cripple Creek. How did that project go? I, I ran into your cruise like it was like one of their last. They said, we're just about done. We have like another day or two to go. And I'm like, I get to go walk on this brand new trail. They, they said, go past there. You can walk on. I'm like, cool. How did that project go? How, what are you hearing from that project? It was beautiful. Um, you know, I went out to about halfway through and uh, went out on a weekend to kind of stumble upon the cruise. I always like to go out and visit them. But um, I was just impressed with the work as well. Um, you know, having known that trail uh, prior to its closure, and then I'm out there hiking along, and then realizing I already went past the the where the reroute started, and I didn't even notice. So um, I was really proud of the work that everybody did out there. And um, I mean, it was a lot. It was a big push. Uh, you know, we it was definitely towards the end of our season, and we were hitting up against some deadlines and also some weird weather that was happening at that time. And that crew really, really pushed, and um, that program manager as well, Elizabeth Barber, really made it happen. And um, it was really cool to see. I don't know, a trail that was pretty close to me, something that I've hiked a whole lot over the years and um, to be able to see the, the the amazing work. And also just the the reroute was needed. I mean, if, if you go out there, I don't even know what it would look like now, but it was definitely needed. And I think just creating that continued sustainability and increased accessibility for, for everybody is, is, I mean, that's kind of what we do. You know, let's talk about that for a minute for the for people who are listening to this. I mean, I I was out there and I've been out there a bazillion times like you have. And I and I'm, you know, I'm I certify as a crew leader. I understand it. But let's talk about why these reroutes are done. What spurs a land manager to come and tell you we need to reroute this trail? Talk to us about a little bit about the history of how trails used to be made and how they're made now and what the difference is and how they're 
they're, I tell people we would not, you know, some of the popular trails around here, we would never build a trail like that this year. And then I spend 20 minutes explaining why. But tell uh, us why, like, for example, the the uh, the Pancake Rocks Trail had to have some, and it's not a complete reroute. It's a piece here and a piece yeah. there and another piece here. Why was that done? I mean, for the most part, it's the sustainability of it. And once, you know, the, a trail continues to erode or um worsen in condition then we're also dealing with safety of of users as well and, and accessibility and and i think we all want everybody to have access to our amazing natural spaces um so how do we do that in in somewhat of a sustainable and, and, and safe manner uh, we can't keep everybody from spraining an ankle but we sure can create you know a better sustained route so that hopefully we don't have to go back and spend more time there um, I think between Pancake Rocks and I mean and Devil's Playground, they're both kind of in that same side of the in the same side of the mountain of Pikes Peak. But um, I think it's really indicative of you know originally when trails came in, people just hiked to get to the top of the mountain, right? So oftentimes it was going straight up a ravine or straight up a a wash or a gully because there are no trees there, right? So it's the natural you know, you eyesight to the top of the mountain. Everybody always wants to get to the top of the mountain or to the water, right? So if you're up high and there's water down below, there's going to be a direct route to the water because we're all attracted to those things. Um, so as, you know, these, especially on, on Devil's Playground, as you start looking at, I mean, some of that trail is wider than, you know, five, six feet, um, which, you know, was created, a, you know, a gazillion, not maybe not a gazillion, you know, you know, 60, 70 years ago or something like that, uh, just by somebody wanting to get to the top of the mountain. So uh, when we have to kind of go in and change some of that. And I'm sure there will be naysayers, Bob, that are like, but it was so difficult and such a great challenge. And But also, how do we make sure that we're not having to spend year after year maintaining these trails? We go in and we, you know, cl make some closures and do some reroutes so that hopefully they, they can sustain with the wear and tear um, and the amount of increased use that we're seeing on our, our local trails as well, instead of having to go back every year and do that work. I guess the best way to describe it is like you were talking about how the trail went up and it you know went up a ravine. It may not have started out as a ravine by going straight yeah. up. It probably was a nice flat path. But the problem with yep. that is, of course, is it's gravity and water. And, uh, you know, it becomes a ravine. And you're talking about, you know, Devil's Playground. Uh, I've hiked that trail, and once you get above tree line, you yeah. were in and out of ravines. You were either crossing them, and you had to climb in and climb out, or you were going up them. And obviously, yep. that's well. We can even take that a step back further. That's why the whole Bear Creek thing happened was because of trails that were built a certain way. And I'm, I'm not going to say anything bad about who built those trails. They built the trail the way they built them in that time. But that ended up causing erosion. Ended up getting into the creek. Ended up choking out this very rare fish. And now you have the big project going on there to preserve them, which I reminded people, be happy that we're working around that because we could have just easily put a fence around it and closed it off. But that's a topic for a different time. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the work that was done in on Red Rock, I'm sorry, in uh, Pancake Rocks was, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there just to get around places where and I, I remember the one spot where he came over the top. And then you had to drop way down and then climb way back up, which sounds like fun, of course, but the route was straight yep. um, and it was eroded and it was a mess. And But you guys created a route kind of around that, which made that a whole lot better. So uh, I thought that was a lot of fun. But let's talk about Devil's Playground. That trail is on the east side, or the, I'm sorry, the west side of, of Pikes Peak, what I like to call the back side, but the people of Teller County get mad when I say that. Um, <laughs> So it's on the west side of, of, uh, of Pikes Peak, starts near the famous Crags Trail, uh, Trail, goes up to the summit, up that side, and, you know, I hiked that trail, and, you know, the part that was in below tree line wasn't terrible, but once you got above tree line, it was not so great. It's a multi-year project, like you've talked about. You're a few years into it. Uh, tell us what that's been like and how that's going. You kind of mentioned you're going to be above tree line this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've spent, you know, the last couple of years, um, you know, getting up to tree line and this is kind of the first year that we're up there, uh, you know, and so it's one of those interesting things because for these last what I think 1.2 or 2.1 miles, one or the other, um, you know, it's, it's trying to figure out what, where's the best place to camp so that we're not hiking half the day to get to the job site every day. And um, I don't know, the logistics to it is, is pretty intense uh, for our crews is, 
I mean, getting out there for every hitch, you know, a hitch is typically eight days um, out in the, in the field. And I mean, it's, it's a whole lot of supplies to be carrying in and out and being, being safe along the way. Um, like we probably have, I think it's, this is 2024. So I think it's the next 24, 25 and 26. I may be off by one year or three more years of field work. And then that last year will be closing the other side of the trail um, that is unsustainable. But yeah, we continue to make great strides in that area. And I mean, just like I said earlier, the, the work has gotten increasingly technical. Um, so the, the skill set and the crews that we're sending out there are also increasingly um, skilled and technical in their own rights. Um, this year, we still have, we're still working with Mile High Youth Corps as well. So they'll be up there, I think, for two hitches with us. Um, so we'll have some extra hands on deck, which is always helpful. Um, and then we do have a couple of you know, really unique kind of volunteer opportunities this year, trying to kind of mix the mix things up a little bit. But I think there's an overnight happening on Devils. Um, if anybody's interested in coming out there and joining us for an overnight. Uh, and then we have a couple of we're trying to create some more signature volunteer events as well. So National Trails Day, Public Lands Day, Colorado. I don't know. There's so many trails days, uh, but I think there's like four or five of them that we're yeah. trying to just create a bigger opportunity for, for the public to come join us. Um, but yeah, I, I do. I'm pretty sure we have an overnight on Devils happening. Cool. Has there been anything that's come up with the Devils Playground Trail that was an, an unexpected thing that you had to deal with? Has, or has it pretty much gone... It's like you're building a whole new trail. I mean, when that first was announced, I'm thinking, oh, they're just going to do the part above tree line, and then realize <laughs> and have to talk to one of your staff members who's now who's now moved on that no, 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 we're going to rebuild the whole thing. I'm like, wow, yep. that's pretty ambitious. Anything pop up that you didn't expect to have happen on that trail? Well, I think a couple of years where we didn't get funding um, through the CPW State Trails uh, Grant Program, I think that was that was a hit. Uh, we definitely didn't get to spend as much time on the trail as we would have liked to have over the past two years. That would be the most unexpected thing would be just that not having that funding for those two years and having to scramble, um, you know, and then move funding around so that we could continue to make some, some headway, but just not the amount of headway we wanted. So let's talk about the challenges of building a trail on Pikes Peak on the, on the West side of Pikes Peak. It's a, it's a pretty short season that you have and this year we've had a fair amount of snow in the pikes peak region and it's yep. it's only april there's still time um i never assume we're safe until sometime between mother's day and memorial day and even that's a little questionable so are you going to be starting pretty soon are you going to maybe that one gonna be <laughs> June or july before you get started on that how how does the weather play into and and uh, the, you know the elevation the topography how does that play into your planning for that it really makes that for a short short window to work in it does. And we, we've definitely, we are trying to make up some time for the last couple of years up on Devils. So we have some overlapping and crews happening this year as well. Um, if you recall, uh, last year we had a crew up there when that tornado hit Pikes Peak. Um, so we were all like scurrying down here in the, in the, you know, in the lay, in the lowlands, like being, oh my God, we got to hear from this crew. We got to hear from this crew. And they really had no idea it happened other than they had some high winds because they were on the other side of the mountain from where that tornado touched down. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're always dealing with the weather. Uh, we've already had the conversation about, because right now, a lot of our program managers are typically trying to get out there to do site previews and to get ready for the project. So we're, we already brought some snowshoes in um, so that we can get out to the, the project sites. Um, and, you know, and even last year, there was, you know, we still had to like shovel snow off the trail to even start working. So this year will be unique, I'm sure. Um, what are we we're in April right now. So I think it's, mid-May when we head up to, to Devil's Playground. Um, and then we'll, we'll stay up there as long as we possibly can, obviously, depending on weather um, and what that looks like towards the end of the season as well. But we're looking at having 10 hitches up there this year uh, with some overlap in there. So there might be two Rimpy crews up there at the same time when Mile High isn't there, uh, but really trying to double up on some of the time. Because uh, 10, is, 10 is a lot compared to the last few years. I think we've done five or six. That is a lot of work. Do you anticipate uh, when you're above tree line, when you're below tree line, it was trees and things like that you had to move. Now it's just going to be dirt and rock. Um, does that make it kind easier? Of. Kind of. Does that make it easier or harder? Or how does that affect 
the the pro or, of course now you're higher in al altitude elevation so that's kind of a compact does that does that make a difference or is it just it takes what it takes uh, do you move faster when you just move in dirt and rock or when you're moving trees in dirt and rock or how's that work yeah i don't i don't know that there's a a, a time frame I, I think it just gets i think honestly i think it gets a little slower because uh, sometimes we're dealing with one ton rocks and we're dealing with crushing rocks in order to create that surface level of the trail um, in order to maintain the the sustainability of it, right? Also, crews are getting up at, you know, four o'clock, 3.30 in the morning to maximize the amount of time they have before those afternoon storms come in. So they're still camping right, you know, below tree line, you know, in order to maintain some safety. But they also, I mean, they're up there at, so early, in the, they start hiking with headlamps on. So by the time they get to the job site, the sun is coming up. Um, so that's just a, it's a big commitment and a big process. And maybe um, it is, I, I don't know that it's any faster or slower, Bob. I think it's just realizing that everything we do is sourced by hand. So, I mean, nobody's flying in timbers or, you know, check dams or anything of that nature. It's it's all sourced there on, from the mountains. So oftentimes you're having to walk further from the job site to find the materials you need as well. And obviously, as we all know, the higher you get, the less of some of those materials there are. And the, the particular challenge with working on Pikes Peak is, of course, the Pikes Peak granite, which is a very specific type of granite. For people who aren't familiar with it, it's very crumbly because it and I always get yelled at by geologists when I say this, it's it's pretty <laughs> porous. Porous is not the right word, but it's the best one I can use to describe it. So water gets into it, and then it crumbles, and it breaks apart. It's very sharp-edged, and it's it's a real pain in the neck to work with. And you're going to be working on that kind of, you know, Pikes Peak granite. I, I imagine that makes it more difficult. You're not dealing with solid rock. You can just cut through it, and it's going to stay there. You're dealing with rock that when you hit it with a sledgehammer or a pick it just kind of crumbles into pieces and it just does in some places in town like i'm thinking north shine canyon park and, and the mid columbine trail it never stops falling into the trail that's kind of one of your challenges on devil's playground right i think there's pros and cons to both right i mean having that rock that's going to be 100 percent you know durable and you can put it in there as a step and you don't think it's ever gonna fall apart fabulous right it's gonna make a great step um but also you know, being able to crush that rock to create, you know, the filler for some of that, you know, the gaps that we have in between that in those areas. I think it, there's pros and cons to every material. Um, obviously unique to Colorado, but um, yeah, I think it just depends on what you're trying to use it for um, in that situation. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, the crews you have, the number of people you have. I'm, I'm guessing that over the years, obviously, you have shifted more and more to hiring more and more people. How big of a staff are you dealing with on a seasonal basis out there now? We have, I think right now, the goal is 24 staff members that are specifically for the field. Um, so they typically start in March and then go through the end of October on a rare occasion, early November. So it, it's, a, it's a good amount of, of time. And we're pretty unique in that area. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of other organizations in Colorado that are similar to ours hire people, but for much shorter time periods. So yeah, it's it's a it's a big haul. We, I think, by the end of the year, everybody's one big big happy family. Hopefully, you know, for the end of the year, <laughs> hopefully within up thirty days or so. But uh, but yeah, but they also bring so much energy and and different. We have people from all over the this, the country that come to to work, and it's it's really unique to have so many different personalities and. Uh, I think it's kind of fun every year to see who shows up and what that character is like for the season. Cool. Cool. If so, anybody has housing, <laughs> <laughs> as you know, most of Colorado Springs, I think that's our, our biggest obstacle is, you know, people coming in and looking for affordable housing. Um, and how do we help in that area? Yeah, I, I know that, you know, for example, the state parks, which hire a lot of seasonal um, staff are, are dealing with the same challenge about, you know, luring people in to come work and then finding that uh, affordable housing can be pretty difficult, especially if you're only seasonal. You can't sign a year lease. You may have a nine month yep. commitment or something like that. So that becomes kind of difficult. Do I remember correctly that last year's season you went a little longer because the weather was, or am I wrong on that? I'm two two seasons that. ago. Two seasons ago. Okay. I do yep. remember that you were, you were you're kind of excited that we can get another week or two in because the weather was kind of a little milder, yeah. but it was two two seasons ago. Okay. 
I, I imagine that there are people who probably are sitting there going, I love to go do that work, but I have a job. Or I certainly don't want to be away for eight days on the side of a mountain where it gets cold even in the <laughs> summer. No, I'm so happy for the people who do want to do that kind of work. If somebody wanted to come and volunteer with you guys, if somebody wanted to contribute in some manner to helping you do that work, how could they do that? Yeah, I mean, just like you at the start of the podcast, Bob, where you send everybody to your website for all the different things, we're, we're in the same boat. Just v- visit us at rmfi.org. Um, and, and there's tabs for everything you can possibly do. We always love volunteers. And, and new this year is we, we're trying to create some more office opportunities um, for volunteers as well. So volunteers isn't just out there, you know, slugging a, a shovel or, or having to camp out on the side of the mountain. But also we have, you know, some office opportunities where we have some stuff with we really need somebody that wants to come in and scan some photos for us because we have a gazillion photos from the 1980s <laughs> that, that really need to be put on a digital drive. We also, you know, if there's anybody out there that really loves chainsaws and wants to help do some maintenance or some work on our tools, um, you know, there's an opportunity to come in on your own schedule and just help with some tool maintenance um, on an, on a, you know, whenever it works for you, because we are always breaking tools um, and they will forever need love. You know, and then in the same way, we were always looking for for board members that are passionate about our mission that would be a good fit. And then the easiest one is anybody that wants to come sling that sledgehammer around or that shovel. Um, we're always looking for those volunteers. Also, we have a considerable number of volunteer days available, which is also on our website. And you can sign up for those days on the website. Um, and then last but not least would be, you know, we're always looking for somebody that wants to financially support our mission. Uh, we're, we're really dependent on. Uh, the community to, to with that support and understanding the value that we bring to the Pikes Peak region and even further down in Southern Colorado. So we're always uh, looking for those people as well. So you have some extra cash lying around, by all means, send it our way. It never hurts. Does it? And you have a thing with, um, with King Supers. We do. Uh, that you can, with the rewards thing and you go online and you, you create an account. I, I actually have been, um, you guys have been my um, nonprofit of choice for my King yep. Supers reward. So uh, I was just looking through that yesterday going, oh, yeah, I forgot. I, I've i been doing that for about six years. <laughs> and I switched, I switched mine when I started. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, to see that come through, too. Uh, King Supers is always fun. Um, and the fact that they offer that is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool of them to do that. And you guys have a newsletter that comes out. Is, is that also a good way for people to, to – um, keep up on what you guys are doing to sign up for your newsletter? It sure is. Our uh, volunteer um, or our community outreach coordinator, um, or I think it's community engage. We just changed our title. Our community engagement coordinator, Cala Ballier, puts that together. And is it's a pretty amazing um, source of material that comes through. So I think it comes out the second Tuesday or Thursday of every month. Um, and you can also sign up for that on our website. And then there's obviously the social media world. Uh, you can always follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I don't think we really, Twitter's not even Twitter anymore, X or whatever it's called. It's X, I don't yeah. think we've done that world. Um, but yeah, Facebook and, and Instagram, you can always follow us on. I, I think Twitter's becoming a dying thing. So yeah, um, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, Jolie, anything else you want to talk to us about? We've had you on here for a while. We've had a great conversation. But is there anything else you want to talk to us about or anything <laughs> you want to tell us or interesting and exciting stuff you got coming up? involved you know, I mean next uh, is earth day right so we have a big earth day uh, volunteer day coming up um and if ours won't be exactly on earth day it's that saturday i think after earth day and i believe we're spread out at several different local parks so hop on that website and come join us um it'll be a, it'll be a fun day and the weather like april hopefully the weather's fabulous and it's not uber uber hot anymore or yet so that would always be a, a good time to get out there before it gets really hot out here in the front country. Or it's not oh. freezing. Yeah, or, or freezing. <laughs> oh, my God, this past weekend, Bob, was ridiculous. You were out of town, so you couldn't join us for the nonprofit of the match at the Switchbacks game. But I kind of wish I had been out of town because it was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> it was April, cold and windy. April is an interesting month in Colorado. It can go in any direction, and yep. it does. And, uh, and uh, you know, you and I were talking prior to this, but um, you're not safe in Colorado from the winter to at least Mother's Day. 
I, I, I usually tell people don't plant anything till Memorial Day. I mean, it, you know, I've, I've got pictures at home that I have taken of six inches of snow in Garden of the Gods on yep. Mother's Day. Um, and it could happen. It hasn't happened in a while, but the way we've had snow this year, it, it, uh, I'm, not, I'm not ruling anything out. So anything could happen. Which is why I'm in the desert right now. <laughs> uh -huh. Hey, um, Bob, it, one last thing that might be yeah. valuable is kind of new this year is we're, we've made sure we maintained a dedicated front country crew all season long so that we can provide more volunteer opportunities that are down here closer to home. Um, oftentimes people were wanting to volunteer during the middle of the summer and we were all up high because that was typically how we would do things is that, you know, the beginning of the season down low and then everybody would go up high and then come back down towards the end. But we were realizing we were missing out on some of those um, opportunities for people to get engaged in and to become involved with us. So we do have a dedicated front country crew the entire summer. So those of you guys out there that have been trying to connect with us during the summer and we just didn't have anything down here, make sure you, you give us a look again. And that, would that be a crew that um, uh, just kind of responds to different things that come up in the in the region that some, you know, land manager might say, fix this or fix that, or they actually have a list of projects to work on? Yep, they have a list of projects. So there'll be a lot of the Garden of the Gods, Palmer Park, Red Rock Canyon, um, kind of our city, county, local. I think that crew is going out to pineries as well. So right. um, they'll kind of maintain that level of work down here th throughout the summer instead of piling everybody in on it at the beginning and the end. You know, you mentioned the pineries and I forgot to bring it back up, but you that was a, you know, El Paso County's newest open space, second newest. Uh, open space and a really popular place, big, you know, nine mile loop around there, pretty cool place. Um, and then it, we had some rain last year and ended up washing out a lot of the trails. They closed it for a while. They reopened it. Uh, that kind of took everybody by surprise because it's like there's no water in there. So where, you know, it, it came out, there's no creek or anything. There's no pond in there. Um, how's that project going with getting that? It, I mean, it's it's open again, but how's it going with finding those those trouble spots and getting them fixed up i think that's that's the key point is that everybody knows where the trouble spots are now right um and as much as there's not a creek out there realize the number of times you're crossing an area on a boardwalk right so that's that boardwalk true. is there because of the what happens when it rains right and there's also i think some of those willow areas out there if i recall correctly right so obviously if there's gonna be willows that usually means there's some water um collecting somewhere but yeah so it's um you know, hopefully we spend, we'll be out there with Mile High Youth Corps um, this year and just, you know, getting pioneers back up to par. I think there's also a plan to increase some of the trail um, access out there also. So um, maybe it'll be more than a nine mile loop. Cool. Actually, what yeah. I'd love to see is if they could buy that. And for people not familiar, it's a loop because the owner of the property, when they gave it to the county, left the inner part of that to themselves. I'm hoping that someday they can talk them into opening that up to the county because it'd be nice to have some trails through the middle and you could cross over it. Not everything has to be a big loop around there. It, it's uh, an easy ride for a bike for cyclists, but for a hiker, nine miles around that loop, none of it's difficult at all by any any stretch. It's pretty flat, yeah. but it's uh, it's nine miles. It's still a, a you know a bit of a trek for a lot of people. So it'd be and nice there's still that work. that one really good view spot. Like I was shocked that the view was that good, but there, you got a, a little bit of like on the other side of the loop from where you park. So what the Eastern side of that loop, there's still that one kind of elevated area. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a good four miles, no matter which way you go to get to that. Yeah. So it's, it's out there yep. a ways, but it's a beautiful view out there. You're, you're correct. So yeah. pretty cool. Jolie, this has been a great conversation. I always, I always enjoy talking with you and, 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 you know, when you and I run into each other at meetings and stuff, it's always fun <laughs> to chat. Um, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Really appreciate the work that Remfi does. You guys have been around for ages um, and, and have always done really good work in the community. And um, I'm pretty excited for the season. That's why I wanted to talk to you, too. You've been there for a while. You've kind of got the feel of it. And your season's kicking off. So kind of got a preview of the work you're going to be doing. But thank you so much for being on the podcast again today. Yeah, thank you for the invite, Bob. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Well, with that, and everybody, rmfi.org, how you can link up with them. Sign up for their newsletter. It's always really fun getting that. If you want to volunteer, a good bunch of people to volunteer for. It's always fun out there with your with your crew, and, and everybody has a good time. Um, and so, Jolie, thank you again for being on the podcast. And everyone, thank you for listening to the Outdoors Hiking Bob podcast. We'll talk to you next time.